Okay, this is Patrick Penry Unbound, and this is your host, Patrick Penry. And I have not had two cups of coffee today, so this may be a little toned down. And I want to cover a bunch of stuff today, but before I get distracted, and, and some of that is the, about the tsunami in the Solomon Islands. A lot of you guys have heard about that. There, there was a three-foot tsunami, and that, that's something we need to discuss. And a couple other a revelation I've had looking through these FOIA documents recently, something that's just, it's hit me all of a sudden. And today, this morning, it hit me in such a way, I'm like, no, nah, I can't ignore this anymore. This is definitely a phenomena that I'm seeing inside these FOIA documents, something above and beyond what we've been talking about. And we need to cover that, too. Also, we'll look into the Robert Alvarez study. And I'll read you the intro on a link online and a website to his, I think it's a 36-page document. It's like 25 pages of, of writing, and then there's some charts and references. But it's in, in particular, it's about the spent fuel situation here in the United States, which is at critical mass right now. And I don't think anyone's in disagreement on that. I mean, we're every place is backed up and loaded up, and not just at the the uh, nuclear facilities, but hospital waste and all that kind of stuff. I mean, where does it go when it's around for thousands of years? You know, we've got a serious problem. But first, let me go right into some documents. And I had a problem with blog talk in the last couple of days. I've been having computer problems, so I wasn't able to post up a link. But I was able to post under my WordPress blog titled Uncovering Plumegate. Again, it's a WordPress blog titled Uncovering Plumegate. And if you go click on the latest uh, entry, I've got the screen captures there that I'm going to read from in just a moment here. So if you want to tag along and look at those as we read these, or it's really not necessary. There's really no charts or maps or, or plume graphs or anything like that that I can pretty much relay to you without you visually looking at this. But I provide screen captures so people can download them and talk about them and you can easily enough copy them. It's kind of strange, though, that I've had a lot of these really good screen captures up in a best of, and no one's really passing them around or jumping all over them. I'm pretty, some pretty shocking, amazing stuff in there, too. So they'll talk about anything and everything but what we'll talk about. And today we're going to look at, isn't that you know mind-blowing, but it's all of it's very insightful into how this cover-up uh, functions and who was involved and and, and you just really get a good overview. If you're not familiar with the insides, the underbelly of how government and, and the corporate industry work, these documents, there's no better source to learn the reality, the reality of how it really works. Now, let me get back to the screen capture. Mr. Bergman, okay. It was ideally to get ideal to get agreement from the various federal agencies involved as to who would be meeting the U.S. government response. Tom, okay, so you would expect the chairman to be on the 1 p.m. call. Mr. Bergman, yes, we would. Tom, okay. Mr. Bergman, that is the principal concern of the so-called industry consortium who is leading this for the U.S. government. Tom, okay. Mr. Bergman, then section is redacted. Mr. Bergman, we did add that as a sub-purpose other than the NRC, but that is probably a sub-purpose. Female participant, because the first priority of the consortium was to establish a total call for Tom. Okay, Mr. Bergman, more logistics and management of the event than the NRC safety accessible. So this was still discussion of that 1 p.m. call, and, and in question here, a couple things. Number one, you know, was that call recorded? Did that go in the documents? Again, it started at page 100 or something on this document, so what's going on here, number one? It's bad enough for getting redacted that I'm missing a total 100 pages in the cover of this particular document. But also agreement from various federal agencies involved as to who would be meeting the U.S. government response. There's a lot of indication in these documents where the federal government is kind of at the beck and call of industry. Industry will tell federal government and define their role and tell them what their role is and lead them in that role and they will be calling the shots. That's what I get out of it. A lot of, at least in one case, I should be more clear on this. At least in one case, they're very clear about that. At least one person here says, yeah, they're going to define the industry role, and I covered this in the broadcast not too long ago. So for me, that's very concerning, the fact that uh, even our own government's really not in control. I mean, if you even if you trusted the electronic Diebold voting machines, even if you trusted Spain or some foreign company that count the votes, even if you 
you know, thought the there's no election shenanigans with Karl Rove involved, right? We still have to then look and say, well, it doesn't matter who we elect anyway, because by and large, they're at the beck and call of the corporatocracy of the industry. They do what they're told. They keep their mouth shut. They'll even be deceivers to a large extent. There's no doubt about it. It is criminal. Yes, there's a lot of criminality contained within these documents. If you look, you will come to the conclusion that this was a conspiracy premeditated to a large extent by a lot of people. They conspire to hide the radioactive plume, especially that initial, you know, sock that we got. The the it's like we got punched like a boxer socked us a couple of times real hard from the first initial plume and fall out. And then it's been a continuation ever since. And they've never been honest with us, right? We've never got rainwater warnings, nothing. In fact, they've gone on a publicity campaign to convince us that the food is safe to eat, right? And that and that's criminal right there, right? I, I think so anyway. So it's very worrisome. Very worrisome because this is what you get when industry calls the shots and the people have no say. And then what a beautiful illusion it is for these people in control, the establishment, the elite, because it's very profitable and they can quite easily fool most of the people most of the time, really don't know. They just, there's so much to keep them distracted and to keep them fooled. Uh, it seems like the perfect crime almost, doesn't it? Again, this next screen capture, page 117, gives the time elapsed of the phone call, but again, I'm still looking for a date on this when it was released in a batch from the 20th to the 23rd, and what is said within rings true, so I have no reason to believe it is not, but I have to be clear on this as, and, and clarify as best I can. Mr. Miller, Bill, Mr. Boardchart, yes, this is Bill, I was just listening, Mr. Miller. Okay, this is Charlie. Mike is in the back room still in discussion on the 1 o'clock call with the chairman and company. The back room, interesting on that as I read over these sometimes, some of these for the second time, um, interesting. I wonder if is everything being recorded in every room of every conversation or is it one particular line and one particular base of phones that's going to be recorded offering a completely private, untraceable, unrecorded line for private discussions, sensitive discussions, right? Okay, Mr. Borchardt says, okay, we terminated that call about 20 minutes ago, so maybe he's having some follow-up. Mr. Miller, he must be having some follow-up discussion, yes. Mr. Borchardt, yes, okay, thanks. I'll just leave the line open to listen in. Thanks, Mr. Miller, okay. Well, maybe you can listen in is where upon the call is concluded. And some of these, like I say, I want to show that there's indication, even if that's not the perfect example and that's not the case there, I've shown multiple times before where it's take it offline or get in contact via a different route that's not being recorded. They even come right out and say that, that they know they're being recorded. And one guy says, look, how can I even do my job? You know, how can I lie and deceive the American public if you're going to record all my... I mean, he was just being up front. No, he has no morals and ethics. But that guy was being very upfront and blatant about the situation that if you're going to show everything I write, I'm going to be unable to hide this stuff from the public, right? And the guy says, no, don't worry. Keep in mind, we have people that redact stuff. And again, we'll talk about that later for you and just what's going on with for you these days. And because if you're just going to redact, you know, huge sections and large chunks, there there really is no Freedom of Information Act. If you if you just leave me a few prepositions and a conjunction or two, that's really not very that's not good enough for me. I need to see more, especially when it's not trade secrets. In the instance of these documents, by and large, we're talking about Mark One containments. It's old. It's outdated. It was wasn't a good design to begin with. It's problematic. It doesn't have redundancy. So nobody's trying to steal that design. It's it's a fail. It's like a cul-de-sac. It's just, you're not going anywhere with it. It's over for that one. You park it. You put it in a museum. Say, hey, that's a prototype. It didn't work. We got 23 here in the states now, and maybe more than that. But a conservative estimate or if, number I found online is 23 Mark I containments here in the United States. And the Alvarez study looks into whether it's a pressurized or boiled water reactor and where they're located and how much spent fuel is stored there and all that kind of stuff. Very interesting and very, very important critical study. Okay, next screen capture. I've titled Clarity on Lead Fed Response. Mr. Borchart, are you comfortable with running the 2 o'clock conference call of the consortium? The consortium is like industry, 
uh, and all these leaders, all these guys together. So the two o'clock conference call is, is a bunch of big wigs. That'd be a term that us Southerners would use, maybe Northerners too, I don't know, but down here, the big wigs is what they are, they're the big boys. Mike, sure, Mr. Boardchart. I know you weren't, you were here yesterday, right? Were you on that? Oh no, that was Sunday, sorry. My days are getting mixed up on me. The way we ran it yesterday was the ET, that's the executive team, ET director just gave a brief overview of plant status in Japan. Then, redacted, gave a summary of the industry initiatives and activities which will largely be a repeat, I think, of what he talked about at the one o'clock call, but it's a different audience here. Then just open it up for any questions and comments not much, maybe just 10 or 15 minutes. The chairman is making a couple follow-on calls from that one o'clock call. I haven't heard any results yet, but we're hoping to get some clarity on the lead for federal response. Again, they're all worried about alignment and making sure that they're on the same page as far as what they're going to tell the public. And when you look at the Q&As, question and answers, and the press releases, and the and what they know and what they're willing, what they're going to tell us, but you know what they know is something altogether different. Again, that's the cover up. That's the evidence of the cover up contained all over in these documents, especially earlier on. And like I say, now they they really are getting heavy handed with the redaction, and I, I see as well in these documents. I'm going to talk about more about this later. That it, it, they're very aware they're being recorded. They know all about the Freedom of Information Act, and I, as they as this message seems to move underground maybe some people in the beginning aren't aware i showed a perfect example where one guy blurted out this particular plume model they were going to do and, and when you read it you can tell he, the other guy was trying to avoid talking about the plume model the other guy blurts it out he's like yeah yeah you know okay great thanks for blurting it out so they know they're being recorded and as time goes on those who weren't aware of it the newbies the noobs if you will right the noobs are figuring it out and so what i see here is is, is as time goes on, you get less and less out of these documents. <laughs> so it's the it's ones in the beginning and leading up to a certain amount. After that, you know, there's still stuff in there, but not as early on when maybe they were a little more uh, free to, or thought they would be a little more free to speak. Okay. Next one I have titled, Information Through Other Channels. Mr. Weber. Thank you very much for joining us. I think we've dialed down the status information that we are providing over these calls because my understanding is that the industry and the other partners are already getting that information through other channels. Once there's a pressing need for that information, what I would suggest we do is talk about what's on our first agenda item, and that is the decision on which agency has the lead going forward. Some of us were on a call that preceded this conference call. My understanding of the current status is that we have not yet determined which lead would serve that lead role, but it's being actively worked by the chairman and by other high-level officials. And this is a perfect example. You see, the guy's beating around the bush. There's things he can't say. So he has to use these certain terms and phrases, and there's a previous call. We don't really get to know what's in that. <clears throat> I can't find it in any case. And so you really have to wonder. It's like they already know about a lot of things, but they're not allowed to talk about it. But you can kind of hint around, and people will get the drift to know what you're talking about. And that's why I get out of this. Buzzy says, because my understanding is that the industry and the other partners are already getting that information through other channels. And that's what it's all about, folks. Information is being channeled, multiple channels, but in the end it's routed into one, concentrated into one. NEI has a... National Energy Institute, a password database where the rooftop grabs uh, went to, and I had evidence and found a particular section of the documents where a guy said, here's what I send to the people at the nuclear plant, their brief, and here's the information that I forward to you. Now, it's all redacted if, it's, if the numbers are serious, right? And, and it's very easy to tell. They're only redacting measurements. They're only redacting measurements, not trade secrets, not national security, military secrets, none of that. They're just and, and I might add, in all of these measurements, nary a discussion of plutonium. So I don't care how low the measurements are that they allow us to see. They redact the big ones. They let us see the little ones. It doesn't matter to me because, I A, I know the big ones exist, and, B, I know amongst all of those, the little and the big, plutonium is floating around. The most deadly substance known to man out of Unit 3, MOX fuel. Oh, it gets worse. It really even gets a lot worse, right? But that's just a, 
a, a tiny tidbit, right? They won't move the Navy ships. They all got blasted. Who knows how much plutonium they inhaled. And if you could get this stuff redacted, I'm telling you, you got a case right there. It's no sense wasting your time with that, though. And maybe you can get a lawsuit there going, I don't know. But it sort of looks to me like channels over here at Navy and White House and what have you knew very well what was going on and had no intention of moving Navy vessels, right? 80,000-plus uh, Navy men and women stationed in and around Japan at the time is my understanding. Okay, so it's channeling information there. We see that there's... And you get this in these documents. You really understand the stratification of information, if you will. And and we're, we're the American public. We are on a need to know basis. Isn't that what they say? And we don't really need to know, and we never will get to know. In the Comanche uh, Peak uh, document that I read into, you could clearly see that if there is a meltdown, they talked about what would happen, the procedure, if there was an, an emergency incident, and it went down to the point of. You know, it may take a sheriff having to drive out to your house and knock on your door and let you know the nuclear plant has had a meltdown. Because not everybody's phone is coded to ring when this happens. It's not like at the a university, if there is a shooting, these kids' phones, they get a message, right? It's not entirely so with these nuclear plants. They don't have KI, potassium iodine stored there. And it may go as far as them having to send someone out to your house. What if you don't have a phone? You know, what if you're someone that just doesn't, I know that sounds incredible, but some people just live out on a farm and they don't have any kind of phone at all. It's possible, right? So it's it's entirely unsafe and they're entirely unprepared. Okay, the next screen capture I have titled Spent Fuel Pool Cooling in the Bechtel Pumps. And this is, I believe, Jim Wiggins, if I remember right, is still speaking here. And this is coming from a brief where they just, every once in a while they have a, a phone call, people join in and they go up and go down the units one through six and describe what situation, what the status is. It says, we understand the importance the INPO has identified for the prompt resolution. Okay, and that one I've written down, that an acronym, INPO, because I found it written IM, M as in Mary PO. So I'm unsure I need to uh, clarify that. I will get back to you guys when I do have that written down to confirm that an acronym. The importance that INPO has identified for the prompt resolution. That sounds like another organization to me, nuclear-based organization. We are taking action in accordance with that importance. We agree that we need to identify who would have that lead role. I think, given that, I would suggest we move on to the next one, which is actions that are currently being worked. I wasn't on yesterday's call, but there are people here with us who were on the call. You should be aware that the NRC team has been working with INPO and with redaction, doesn't say, names redacted, on exploring a number of mitigating strategies that could be used to restore cooling for the spent fuel pool at the Fukushima Daiichi units. My understanding is that the first shipment of equipment to support the first train has departed Australia and is either momentarily arriving in Japan or is close to it. And that shows, I clipped this one because, well, for nothing else, you see that the pumps we've talked about, the Bechtel pumps, the $9.8 billion pumps that John Q. Taxpayer is going to foot the bill. DOD paid for them, but again, that's coming right out of what? That big military budget. That's why we're running our, again, you, you really do want to get the pumps in there, and anyone's going to have to pay for them in the end. But my understanding, again, quickly on those pumps is they, Eventually, they were offered for free. If not right off the bat, in the end, they said, look, just take the pumps you can have or whatever. But then there was some finagling, and the DOD has billed John Q. Taxpayer for the $9.8 billion. That in and of itself is huge right there. And, I, you know, people are ignoring what's in these documents. And there's even a mention that JAXCO has broken a number of laws in a, a letter that was written to him from a guy with a public safety commission or someplace like that. I have to pull it back up. There's all sort of incredible stuff in here. Really, there is. So on this one, you know, it just shows that, uh, if nothing else, mitigating strategies that could be used to restore cooling for the spent fuel pool. This is past day 20. I'm pretty sure this is around day 23. There's still no cooling. There's still no cooling. There's water cannons. There's the concrete truck spraying stuff. They had a number of uh, flyovers in the helicopter just for show because in the documents, they're, they're, they're very clear, at least our boys are, about 
the fact that that's largely ineffective and just for show and doesn't do any good. And then they say there's no water in the spent the fuel pool number four upstairs. There's nothing in it. Right, and I find out today, 15 hours, that stuff melts right through the concrete. And it was, again, we're looking at, what, 12, 13 days in, there's still no real coolant flow has been established. So that's very concerning. Now, that means the worst uh, we can uh, suspect has likely happened. When there's no cooling to this stuff, the temperatures are insanely high. I, 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 I uh, understated the temperatures the other day because I pulled this other article up and I look at it, and this was... Uh, Brookhaven um, laboratory uh, simulation they did on a meltdown for a plant over here that's a Mark I containment almost identical to Fukushima. And it's very interesting. Some of these studies have already been done. I kind of want to get distracted. Back to the FOIA document. This one I've labeled technical assistance offline from page 127. Mr. Troutman, yes, sir. Mr. Weber, redacted. In terms of the work that you've been doing with the NRC team on specific technical solutions, are those discussions progressing well? Name is redacted. Again, there's a number of names in here that are being redacted. We don't get to know who these people are. And that's kind of strange in and of itself. Don't you think that nuclear power being clean and emission-free and as safe as it is, I really don't see any reason why someone wouldn't speak out and, and say, no, I don't have a problem with people knowing I work with nuclear power. I'm proud and I'm honored to speak out and be open and upfront. I work with nuclear power. I work, my name is Patrick Penny and I work with nuclear power. Instead, instead, redacted. So I have to conclude, like I, I make this analogy, it's like grave robbing. Some people don't really want to advertise they're in the nuclear industry because they, they really did like a huge juggernaut, this giant stone juggernaut just crushing anything in its way. More often than not, the plants are built and no one can stop them. I was amazed to see uh, within the last year they stopped the building they of one plant. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head want to say where it was. You can find it on the uh, NIRS website. But they have been able to stop the building of them before. But by and large, they just come in like leave you one and two. And you can't contest on the grounds that they're inherently unsafe. You have to show some ecological stress or it's not enough water supply or something like that. It's, it's, it's totally uh, counterintuitive and doesn't make any sense, right? Because just based on historically on the meltdowns, that would be my argument. And if I could bring it to a jury of my peers in a regular court of law, I think I could have a pretty good chance at having, you know, six or 12, whatever number of people's on the jury uh, come into a decision saying, yeah, we got to shut all this stuff down and release the patent, suppress patent technology. And there's an article today <clears throat> where someone's coming out to say, we just need to do away with the whole patent system altogether. It's not helping this country at all. We got thousands and thousands of patents being suppressed of very efficient power generating systems. And this seems to be a problem when over 5,000 patents in the year 2010 had already been suppressed here by a Union of Concerned Scientists study, if I'm not mistaken. But yes, that's a major problem. Why are we saddled with nuclear power? Because they won't let us have solar and they won't let it exist in the capacity which it can. They won't help finance it to any great degree but they'll subsidize a nuclear power plant. It's just absolutely, incredibly uh, insane on a scale I've not seen before. I mean, it's crazy to take a dirt bike in the X Games and run off a ramp and do a flip in the air. It's even crazier to take a dirt bike and do a front flip in the X Games. It's crazy to do one of a, a snowmobile. But even crazier is to have a nuclear power plant. It's just the scale of craziness that shatters the crazy -o meter. There's no crazy -o meter that goes that high. It's, it's, it's beyond crazy. The only nuclear reaction I approve of, I do approve of a nuclear reaction. It's called the sun. And that one I approve of. All right, let's do one more here. Because in terms of the work that you've been doing with the NRC team on specific technical solutions, are those discussions progressing well? Name redacted. I'm not familiar with any specific technical discussions. Ours have been pretty much requests for different material support, so maybe we can have something offline if our sense is we should be receiving technical discussions from the NRC. We do feel, though, our routine calls with the Ops Center and those discussions seem to be going quite well as far as status and conditions and understanding of the situation. Okay, continue to next page. Mr. Weber, I know NRC looked to the industry channel through INPO 
to work with us to ensure the technical viability of the solutions that are being identified and pursued. The last thing we want to do at the NRC is propose something to our Japanese counterpart that's not going to work. While we can effectively regulate our ability to actually execute and make certain things work remains to be seen. That is why I think you all are a key player as far as a consortium to bring to the table that kind of expertise and also identify what kind of challenges might exist in implementing the solution. Name redacted. We probably need to discuss that further because that is not a role right now that at least I feel we are actively involved in. That would be something that we need to talk about. Mr. Weber, okay, why don't we have that conversation offline? Again, I think that redacted name is someone from the DOE we'll see show up in another screen capture. It's redacted. They mentioned DOE. So I have reason to believe that's someone with the DOE. Hey, okay, why don't we have that conversation offline? Hey, buddy, what are you trying to hide from us, man? Seriously, what are you? Are you spies or something offline? I thought nuclear power was clean and safe and emission-free and, and a wonderful way to produce energy, but we don't want our names to be shown, and we want to talk offline about the serious stuff, especially on day 12, 13. People know darn well you keep your mouth shut and you just use generalizations. That's certainly the way it seems. That's the feel to the documents. Name redacted. I appreciate that. We can do that after this call. Mr. Weber, okay. After this call, we're going to take it offline. You guys get that? Mr. Weber, okay. Are there other actions that are currently underway that are being worked that we ought to coordinate on this call? Male participant, not from here. Mr. Weber, okay. Jason, you're on from the USED Coordination Center. Anything you're aware of that we should be aware of? Jason, no, not at this time. I think the rest of this was just routine stuff, and the, and the top of this screen capture was what was important that they, you know, we can do that after this call. They're going to take it offline, and when it really gets serious now, you see, they'll redact it, but they'll also try to ease up on the people that have to do the redacting by just not putting it there in the first place to make it where they have to redact it. And, and it's really obvious when you look at the two documents I posted up and did a couple broadcasts on about the Navy ships and the angst at moving them. Clearly in those documents, if you read those two through, read the first one and read the all the way through its entirety and then read like the first 50 pages of the second one. Past that, it goes on out of the Navy ships and they don't talk about it. But if you read those two, you really get the idea that the redacted sections, anytime they start talking measurements, they've taken measurements, unless they meet a low number, and someone's going there and said, anything below this threshold, you can leave. Above that, redact it. And that's what they've done. And it's very obvious because the conversation, the flow of conversation centers entirely around these measurements that they've been taking and measurements, information on measurements they've been receiving. And it's very worrisome that some of them are so high. Well, that'd be the ones that are redacted. And even still, there's some stuff they throw out there that's pretty serious anyway, you know. So something to keep that in account. Okay, let's see. That's about 40 minutes of these documents. I want to cover a couple other things, and I want to read to you that section, uh, the report or the overview of the Robert Alvarez report. So let me pause on that. Oh, also at the bottom of this last screen capture, there's another indication that the pumps were due to land any time now. That's important to me as a researcher because it says on this date, between the 20th and 23rd, the Bechtel pumps aren't even there yet. They, don't, they can't even get a, a real solid flow of gallons per minute or what some incredible amount they need to pump. They discussed the tonnage of water that's needed to keep those things cool. They've been using seawater all this time, even in the spent fuel pools, right? So that's a very serious situation, the caking up of the salt and what have you. And a lot of this is an ex ongoing experiment that, you know, no one's ever had to pour salt water in, uh, in reactors and in spent fuel pools in a situation like this. So who knows what's going on in there with all these biological and other chemical compounds and substances that are in the ocean. Okay, so let me close this out. So there is a earthquake again, and I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, we had an earthquake, 8.0, I believe, in a remote part of the Solomon Islands. We've got a Yahoo article up that I'm looking at by routers. So we can at least trust routers to, yes, there was a tsunami, and they'll tell, tell us honestly the size of it and other things like that. No one's going to tell us if it's an organic earthquake or not, and right now that's the question right now. Is there a cartel with this incredible technology that 
um, General uh, William S. Uh, let's see, what the heck's his name? Um, Cohen, right. There we go. William S. Cohen back in 97. Just totally forgot that. Uh, Cohen alluded to the fact that there are eco-terrorists even then that were using electromagnetic waves to set off earthquakes and volcanoes. So that's very telling into the scientific pursuit of some of these weapons technologies. They're very aware that, you know, if, if General Cohen is saying others may have it, well, certainly America's got it, right? <clears throat> if other countries are developing it or have just developed it, we more likely than not have already had this technology available to us and can use it. Uh, as they see fit. And again, it's very profitable if you look at disaster capitalism and the fact you can engineer a storm, you could create an earthquake, any number of things to damage homes and property, and then people have to go and rebuild and buy more stuff. And it forces people to spend money if you think about it. It's like a forced tax in the most brutal kind of way possible. Plus, you get to sell your climate change, and Arnie Gundershill can tell us that nuclear power will save us from climate change. Well, they know it's by and large, this is induced phenomena that's exaggerated by these chemtrails and by the electromagnetic waves. Again, just like William S. Cohen said back in 1997, our own general, U.S. general, uh, was very clear about that. So that's something to worry about. Now, the tsunami, again, raises the specter of all these plants we have that are on the coast. And I'm on the east coast of Florida. Hey, I'm more worried than anybody. You guys got to send free on the a west coast and in Diablos on an earthquake fault, I don't know that it's that close to the coast, but if you look at the NRC a map, you can see it's, it's not that far away. But on the east coast, it's just all up and down from South Carolina to like Turkey Point and St. Lucie and then Oyster and uh, oh, Indian Point and a couple of those others. If you look, if they're not right on the coast, there are these waterways that go up. They're very close. A real serious tsunami. Even maybe bigger than the one in Japan would be a major problem. Again, we can see in the documents the salt water when it washes up into everything. They can run AC power in and have a hard line, but it's not going to do any good because circuitry, control panels, computers, all sort of stuff's been damaged. Not to mention the incredible rads and shine that are being given off because they're using mock fuel, which is, has plutonium in it. So something to keep in mind, this is the realities of a meltdown. Meltdowns, especially catastrophic multiple meltdown. We look at a time that elapsed in that Fukushima. That's the incredible thing. I'm in the documents on date or March 23, 12, 13 days after the catastrophic meltdowns, and still there's no power is sufficiently has been has not been resolved. There's not a sufficient flow of cooling, certainly not a fresh water, not even fresh water, okay? And that's not even what they normally use in there besides its sterile conditions. Right? There shouldn't be anything in there but their special uh, coolant, kind of like in your radiation, your radiator in your car, very similar to your coolant there. It would be a specific kind of coolant that helps keep it cool to a better, with a better capacity. So once that's tainted, once that got biological agents or debris or what have you in there, it's a whole other ball game. We're talk, talking, um, what's the word for it? Very sterile clinical conditions is how I would describe it that these nuclear plants maintain, and they have to because it's very tight tolerances. We're not talking a 350 Chevrolet combustion engine where if something happens, the radiator pops, coolant leaks out. Hey, we're all going to be fine. This is completely different. You guys are. Undoubtedly, if not aware of this by now, you're certainly becoming aware of the damned seriousness of the situation. I don't try to cause any panic. I, I, we need a measured, logical, thought-out response where everybody starts getting involved because that is what it's going to take. If 5% of the population know the, the seriousness and the reality of nuclear power and the other 95% don't or don't care or what, whatever the reason is, I've seen that to be a very difficult ratio to get anything done, politically speaking. Very difficult. You can call and you can have a blog talk and write your congressman and do a video and that kind of stuff. But in the end, it's sheer numbers that we need. And we need to awaken people to the reality. So the reality was tsunamis happen all the time. Earthquakes are happening all the time. There's just a extinction protocol thing. My wife said something to me about the other day. It was three earthquakes within a week or eight points or something like that. There are big ones happening all the time. So geologically speaking, especially in this period of heightened activity that we find ourselves in, and this is a proven fact. This is an absolute proven fact. 
unless you're totally asleep and you have no clue. It's even more worrisome than ever. Okay, even if Fukushima was a natural earthquake and a natural tsunami, are we waiting for the next one on the East Coast? Because what if a 50-foot tsunami sweeps over? What if a 100-foot tsunami sweeps over? I know it's a what if, what if. Now, I'm not in the fear-mongering at all, but I'm telling you the sheer number of nuclear plants around the world, the fact that we're mostly a water planet, I mean, it seems to me we're taking an awful chance. And here again is a very recent example. It's only a three-foot tsunami. True, true. But that's serious enough to have killed people. People died in this recent one. What's going to happen when a 10-foot, a 15-foot? Again, if you wet down these sensitive electrical components, it's not all watertight. Not everything's watertight. Some stuff is below the ground even. So that's worrisome. When those components go out, we have a difficulty maintaining coolant. It's a very fine line. You can't just turn off the ignition and coast off the side of the road. It's not even like an airplane where you can jump out with a parachute and maybe survive. This one, you got to stick it out and take care of things. And Fukushima's horrible. The Japanese are having to deal with that. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, I don't even want to try to describe it. Look at Chernobyl. There's not much difference. There's going to be a lot of deformities and all that kind of stuff as a result. Where do they go? And you know, I've noticed there's a lot of rich men around this planet with thousands of acres, millions of acres even, some rich establishment figureheads have, but no one's offered, even with this massive amount of wealth and resources, to extract people from neighboring, uh, what do they call them there, the precincts or whatever in Fukushima. Where's the, where are these philanthropists, right? Where's the Bill Gates, the good guy he claims to be, wouldn't you? I would pay for them to move out. I'd say like Ted Turner has 10,000 acres up near Tallahassee, right? No one can use it. He doesn't use it, but it's there, right? So what I would be thinking is I would even command his president that you don't have any choice per se. That 10,000 acres, we're going to have to commandeer it. We're going to run a boat over there or fly them over here and get some people out or rescue them or send them somewhere, isn't there? Wow, seems crazy nothing's going on in that area of time to evacuate. Again, what does that mean? Well, as soon as you evacuate people, people around the world begin to understand how serious it is. Why did Gregory Jaxco catch so much flack? Because he said, you need a 50-mile evacuation zone. Ten miles is not going to be sufficient. What did that mean? On a large scale, all these people that have been harping at the NRC all these years, long before I even figured out and awoke and figured out what was going on, they've been getting on to the NRC and the nuclear industry about the fact some of these are located so close to big cities like New York City. That's the thing with Indian Point. It's within a 50-mile evacuation zone of New York City. How are you going to do that? And, and folks, let me tell you something. Now, I've proven this, and it's in the documents. I've posted up the screen captures. I've been very clear on this. Tokyo got hit. They downplayed it, of course, but Tokyo got hit. You can look at the plume maps and the plume heading exactly that way, leaked TEPCO documents that our guys had access to. It's in the Freedom of Information Act, and you can hear them talking about it. They won't show you the big measurements. That's all redacted, but we now know about the MOX fuel, and wherever any emanation is, I don't care how small the potential for plutonium to be floating around in the air is there. That is a fact. And knowing that and knowing the MOX fuel, which they're trying to bring to Tennessee Valley here in the States, they want to bring MOX fuel here to plutonium. Do you guys think that's a good idea with tsunamis happening all over the place, earthquakes, all the terrorist strikes on buildings, bringing buildings down? Let me just say something. There's really no protection from a big aircraft flying into a nuke plant. I mean, what's going to stop them? Uh, an F-16 that can't seem to scramble in time to stop them from hitting two buildings? I don't, you know, it doesn't look good. It really doesn't. Now, so can we have national security with these nuclear reactors and a Mark I containment and tsunamis and earthquakes and terrorist attacks? I tell you, it's impossible. The very, the very fact we have... 23 Mark I containment server. There's no way. New, uh, national security impossible. It, it's impossible. You cannot. You absolutely cannot. Cannot. In fact, let me read real quick from this. See if I can find the site that I found. And it talks about, here we go, talks about evacuation zone. This is from the Physicians for Social Responsibility, PSR.org. Positions for Social Responsibility at PSR.org. These are the ones, I think, that filed early on for Freedom of Information along with Friends of the Earth, if I'm not mistaken. It says, do you live within 50 miles of a nuclear reactor? One-third of Americans do. 
property contaminated by nuclear materials is not covered by insurance. So if your house is affected, you could be displaced permanently and lose everything. Use the tool below to find out if you are within an evacuation zone and are at risk. Also notice the number of people who would have to be evacuated if there was an accident at the plant closest to you. Do you really think that is possible? We don't. And that's what this indicator does. Again, if you're in New York, I ask you go to the Physicians for Social Responsibility, go into the Evacuation Zones for Nuclear Reactors page, type in your zip code, and get a nice shock. Because like they say, one-third of Americans do. Now, for me, it's like a bittersweet because, and I think I've seen the headline to an article today where Crystal River is going to be shut down permanently. I hope that's what that article was implying. But I'm almost in Gainesville, Florida. I'm very close to the 50-mile evacuation zone from Crystal River. Now, that's great news to hear. They may be shutting that place down. The crack is big in the containment. They can't fix it and we probably don't want to really know the details of what happened at Crystal River. We'll never know. But the bittersweet part is they want to build Levy 1 and 2, which would put me directly in a 50-mile evacuation zone, a lot closer than that even, probably within 40 miles. And that, for me, is extremely, knowing what I know now about the nuclear situation, it's not good. And I, and I say that because I don't doubt their new technology is new and improved. I'm sure it is, and it's safer than ever, although it's still not uh, fail-safe, not 100% uh, uh, proof from some incident. I'm worried about the terrorist attack. And I use that term loosely because we find all governments of the world conduct false flag terrorist attacks on their own country. For what? To get their citizens to get behind them in a war is a great example. There's all number of reasons you can for doing this, passing legislation, gun control, things that you normally couldn't do. And it's, it's very foolish to think that governments wouldn't do this because historically they have. I mean, throughout the years, from Hitler to Stalin to Mao Zedong, all these guys have the same uh, kind of operations that going on a large scale. I know if you get detailed, there's differences between them, but on a large scale, it's all about control. It's all about control in the end, isn't it? Right, And we're certainly being controlled in that we don't really have a say in nuclear power. Industry runs the show. You can vote all you want. Ron Paul won't talk about it. Romney won't talk about it. Obama won't talk about it. Alex Jones won't talk about it. Mainstream will not talk about this. It's simply, it's occult. It's forbidden. And so there's not a big move to uh, do anything right now as far as systematically shutting down. And first, we need to say, look, no more new ones. End of story. Don't make half the country move. Because you are going to make me move. I grew up here. I grew up in Jonesville. I was born in Patchogue, New York, but that was only for a month or so, is my understanding. Then we moved down here. My dad got a job at the University of Florida teaching general chemistry at the university, and, and we've been here ever since. When my parents divorced, I lived in Oregon with my mom. It wasn't even for a year. Things didn't work out there, and I ended up back here again and pretty much been in, I've been in Florida ever since. Lived in Orlando, but mostly right here in Central Florida. So... Please don't make me have to move. I mean, this is my hometown. It's bad enough the springs are drying up because they spray the chemtrails every day. Every day. The farmers don't know. And they've been up in arms about it because they want to offer the farmers a micro loan, right? And then when the chemtrails keep going and the rain never comes, you end up owing a lot of money. And the farmers aren't necessarily falling for that. I saw a TV20 interview where the farmer said, look, no sense taking a loan because if the rains don't come, if there's not going to be any water, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at me. I can't make plants grow without water. And our aquifers tapped, and our springs are starting to run dry. It's pretty serious here in Florida. I always say if they stop the planes, it will start the rains. And they kind of know that. And if you know where they're going to spray and where the rain's not going to be and what crop is being grown there, in theory, one can make quite a bit of money on the on Wall Street if you know what to bet's going to go up, what to bet's going to go down. It could be incredibly lucrative. Plus, you can grab up land when these small micro farmers uh, fail. They just have to sell their land. You buy it up, a big corporation, they let it sit fallow. They don't grow anything on it at all because it's driving up the price. See how this stuff works? Our country is incredibly broken to a degree that, like I'm a musician, I can't even believe I'm, I've had to start reading books and getting informed and getting involved. And everyone should. Everyone should. So this position for social responsibility really is an eye-opener on this particular page. You can type in your zip code and see what you're next to. And then if you want, you can follow that up by going to the Robert Alvarez um, study and, and look at these specific, specific plants, nuclear plants, and see what kind of fuel they actually have stored there because it's quite staggering the amount uh, that we have. Some are even more 
but then Fukushima Daiichi. So some have the potential to be even worse. Now, since I wasn't able to post a link up, and I'm pretty sure on Uncovering Plumegate, my WordPress blog, there's a link to this particular document. Yes, that's my neighbor's little low rider car with the pipe on it that makes so much noise, and you probably can hear that because the Rhodes microphone is very sensitive. And I didn't post up a link on this because Blog Talk's given me a fit recently. But the gentleman's name is Robert Alvarez. My mom said my dad's known him or has some, you know, all these nuclear guys know each other. They really do. And this seems to be one gentleman, Robert Alvarez, that is willing to speak out at least in regards to the spent fuel storage situation here in the United States, which is quite serious, very serious. And the fact he's speaking to it is to be commended because a lot of people really don't want to speak out. It's, it's dangerous, especially if you're on a higher level. If you get a lot of attention, uh, if you're in a notable position, you can lose your job by speaking out against the nuclear industry. So they just keep their mouth shut by and large. It's like a, uh, the guy told me they pay him just enough to keep quiet and they don't talk, right? That was a guy I was talking to one night about patents and everything. And they do need to get rid of the patent system, no doubt about it. Because there's suppression going on, and, and like I say, people get their cut, and they don't say anything about it. It's just plain wrong. It's plain wrong. Meanwhile, the people are starving and hungry and have no energy and so on and so forth. Not to get distracted. But. Okay, so I'm reading from Robert Alvarez. The title of the study is called Spent Nuclear Fuel Pools in the United States, in the U.S., Reducing the Deadly Risks of Storage by Robert Alvarez, A-L-V-A-R-E-Z. And if you Google that or type that in, it will bring you to a, a page here. Let's see, what is what am I looking at here? Institute for Policy Studies. Yep, this is the Institute for Policy Studies, IPS, that's hosting this. So good job, guys. Okay, the header reads, The price of fixing America's nuclear vulnerabilities may be high. But the price of doing too little is incalculable. Oh, gosh, I could have said it better myself, folks. It really is a red alert. Not to panic. Don't freak out. But, hey, we all got to start getting busy and getting involved and start shouting as loud as we can. It says, U.S. reactors have generated about 65,000 metric tons of spent fuel, of which 75% is stored in pools, according to Nuclear Energy Institute data. Spent fuel rods give off about 1 million rims, 10,000 sievers, I think it's trying to say, it's missing a zero there, of radiation per hour at a distance of one foot. Enough radiation to kill people in a matter of seconds. There are more than 30 million such rods in U.S. spent fuel pools. No other nation has generated this much radioactivity from either nuclear power or nuclear weapons production. Nearly 40% of the radioactivity in the United States spent fuel is cesium-137, 4.5 billion curies roughly 20 times more than released from all atmospheric nuclear weapons tests. U.S. spent pools hold about 15 to 30 times more cesium-137 than the Chernobyl accident released. For instance, the pool at the Vermont Yankee reactor, a BWR, boiled water reactor, Mark I, currently holds nearly three times the amount of spent fuel stored at Daiichi's crippled Unit 4 reactor. The Vermont Yankee reactor also holds about 7% more radioactivity than the combined total in the pools of the four troubled reactors at the Fukushima site. That should give you a good idea right there what, how we're stocking up comparing to Fukushima. Uh, we're we're in, getting in a pretty serious situation. Even though they contain some of the largest concentrations of radioactivity on the planet, U.S. spent nuclear fuel pools are mostly contained in ordinary industrial structures designed to merely protect them against the elements. Some are made from materials commonly used to house big box stores and car dealerships. The United States has 31 boiling water reactors with pools, okay, 31, so there's my correction from my 26, which was an old, uh, I got out of a FOIA document, so I just screen captured that. I, like I say, that was a conservative number there. I'd rather err on the side of caution if, if possible. The United States has 31 boiling water reactors with pools elevated several stories above ground, similar to those at the Fukushima Daiichi Station. As in Japan, all spent fuel pools at nuclear power plants
plants do not have steel-lined concrete barriers that cover reactor vessels to prevent the escape of radioactivity. They are not required to have backup generators to keep used fuel rods cool if off-site power is lost. The 69 pressurized water reactors operating in the U.S. do not have elevated pools and also lack proper containment, and several have large cavities beneath them which could exacerbate leakage. For nearly 30 years, NRC waste storage requirements have remained contingent on the opening of a permanent waste repository that has yet to materialize. Now that the Obama administration has canceled plans to build a permanent deep disposal site at Yucca Mountain in Nevada, spent fuel at the nation's 104 nuclear reactors will continue to accumulate and are likely to remain on site for decades to come. And I might add here that in the FOIA documents, it's clearly indicated that the White House asked for and received a summary and analysis of the spent fuel situation here in America. They, they did want to know what we had and where it was. So they can't claim uh, ignorance or they're out of the loop because they're very well knowledgeable and versed in the amount of spent fuel that we have here stored in America. According to the Energy Department data, the spent fuel stored at 28 reactor sites have between 200 to 450 million curies of long-lived radioactivity. And 19 reactor sites have generated between 100 to 200 million curies in spent fuel. And 24 reactor sites have generated about 10 to 100 million curies. And don't worry so much about these technical numbers and curies and all these terms and what have you. What's you know, what's important to know is, is simply thus. It is a crap ton of fuel we got backlog storing up. That's, that's, you don't need, that's a technical term we can work with, a crap ton, right? It is. It really is because low-level ionizing radiation is bad, okay? It's very bad for you. You just can't get around that. It's not good. It's very bad. And so what we see here is a massive amount of fuel that is stored. A massive amount, not just a little bit. That's all you need to know about this. It's not just a little bit. It's a massive amount of fuel being stored around the country, not in one spot. And the reason they said you can do that is they said, well, we're going to build this uh, repository in Yucca Mountain. I almost said suppository. It's kind of like a suppository the way it feels, doesn't it? We're going to build this repository at Yucca Mountain in Nevada, and we'll put it all there, and it'll be fine. Well, they said, no, nah, it might not be the best idea. Let's not do that in the end. Now all this stuff's been accumulating. Now we got a situation. we got a real situation on our hands, and the can will be kicked. we got a lame duck in office that's going to kick on down the road. Obama doesn't want to deal with it. He's promoting nuclear power. Are you kidding me? Clean and emission-free. Romney says it, too, not to pick on Obama, because I love all people, Palestinians, Israelis, blacks, whites, Indians, all of them, everyone. Even the bad guys. I'm commanded to love them. And I do. I love them. I love the trolls and the shills and all the agents, all those guys. They don't know it yet. They haven't figured it out yet. They haven't reached a state of enlightenment and realized there's a lot more important in the world than power and control and material possessions and sex and drugs and all that kind of. It's all nonsense. It doesn't last. None of that last. None of that's going to last for you. You'll still have an empty feeling, and you're never going to know true friendship. You will never know true friendship if you're a deceiver. You can't, because you're a deceiver by your very nature. You will never know that special level. Not to get distracted, but I do a bit of preaching sometimes, I suppose. I'm a life coach. I'm a bit of a life coach, because I've I screwed my life up so bad for so long Right, I can now tell you what to do based on what I know not to do. Right, it's amazing. It's like the uh, <laughs> oh, what's the one movie with Robert Redford? I don't think it's Cool Hand Luke. It's another one where he says, "I know the law, my friend, as I've been in its flagrant violation my entire life." <laughs> so, so because he had broken the law so much, he was an expert in the law. Is what he was trying to say. Okay, back to the article. Over the past 30 years, there have been at least 66 incidents at U.S. reactors in which there was a significant loss of spent fuel water. 66. That's a lot, don't you think? Ten have occurred since the September 11 terrorist attacks, after which the government pledged that it would reinforce nuclear safety measures. Over several decades, significant corrosion has occurred of the barriers that prevent a nuclear chain reaction in a spent fuel pool. 
some to the point where they can no longer be credited with preventing a nuclear chain reaction. For example, in June 2010, the NRC fined Florida Power and Light, great, that's right in my neighborhood, huh? Fined Florida Power and Light $70,000 for failing to report that it had been exceeding its spent fuel pool criticality safety margin for five years at the Turkey Point reactor near Miami. Wow! 70000 That's nothing. That's like finding me a nickel. And I'm broke and don't have a job. I can. I got change, a uh, bucket of change in there. I can give you a nickel right now. No big deal. Got it. Can do. They can pay that easy. Hey, we're subsidized. Interestingly enough, NRC finds, this is just hitting me, the conundrum, the irony. The NRC, right, fine Florida Power 70000 for failing to report that's been exceeding this limit. Right? But we're subsidizing all these things. Anyway, we're subsidizing being built. They don't turn a profit. So it's really they find the taxpayers, John Q. taxpayers. So in, in real essence, I look at that and say, that that did nothing. That's a joke. That's a hoax like Sandy Hook. That's a hoax right there. It's just, it's just not real. It doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. Something doesn't ring true with it when you think about it. Because of NRC's dependency on the industry's self-reporting problems, <laughs> Man, wow. All I can say is, how do they get away with this? And how is it people don't know? Isn't this incredible? Because of NRC's dependency on the industry's self-reporting problems, it failed to find out that there was extensive, again, it's just, I can, almost can't even keep reading this, because 66 incidents, because of the NRC's dependency on self-reporting problems, well, after the, how many incidents afterwards did you say, look, we can't rely on them to self-report? I mean, that's what I want to know. At what point, what's the learning curve here? Because I can look at this right now as I'm reading this. I've read this before, but this is a refreshment. I've done a lecture on this, actually. If you go to my HP blog and type in uh, Spent Fuel Pool or Alvarez or whatever, you'll come back with this. I've already done a, a lecture and screen capture. I've got a video on YouTube or multiples of. Anyway, so I've covered this before, but still, it's a, it boggles your mind every time when you live your life a certain way and then you look at other people conducting their operations that affect other people, and it's, it's not using logic or common sense at all, just absolutely none at all. You would immediately said, look, after the 10th time, don't you think maybe we need to uh, renege that command, pull that one back in, let's issue another one that says, uh, with self-reporting, no, that doesn't work anymore now. Uh, I suppose, and again, again, it's not cost-effective if we've got to send out this horde of inspectors to sit there and micromanage these plants because they're dangerous and they won't report problems, right? This is insane. This is the frigid safety culture, too, that I've spoken about as well. Absolutely crazy. Absolutely mind-boggling. But even after 66, it's still, yeah, you just report, self-report. We'll trust you, right? Even after this, the dependency on industry self-reporting problems, it failed to find out that there was extensive deterioration deterioration of neutron absorbers in the turkey point pools and lengthy delays in having them replaced. This near Miami, man. Wow. A lot of, how many millions of people there, huh? Yeah, it's like Indian Point with New York. That's why the anti-nuclear activists are so concerned, right? Because it's close to a population center, a very large population center. You can't just wave a magic wand and say, okay, teleport them to another planet where they'll be safe. And the, uh, look at Tokyo. Again, I tell you at Tokyo, even Arnie Gundershill admits he scooped up dirt in Tokyo that over here would be classified as nuclear waste and had to be disposed of. So there's plenty to indicate Tokyo got hit, and, and there's some disinformation going on. If you type in Tokyo Fukushima radiation and Google that and look, you'll see there is a PSYOP run where they go in and say, we got radiation in Tokyo, we found it. And then if you read the article, it's some dentist or doctor's basement where they found some radioactive material not related to Fukushima at all. It's a very clever bit of disinformation, disinformation to steer you away from finding the true nature of what happened, which is largely contained within the FOIA documents. And you can see, yes, Tokyo got hit, and they got hit hard. And and we'll see 5, 10, 20 years, I keep reading about the latent cancers. It doesn't always happen right away. Of course, we're seeing plenty of effect in Japan now. It's incredible what's really going on. You just have to dig around in the underground to find out. It's not being broadcast in the alternative media, not what's happened to the people that I, I don't see it anyway, the sickness, the the radiation poisoning effects of all that. There's a couple places to do a little bit about it, but by and large, no, they don't want to. They really probably don't want to uncover that as well. Okay, back to the article here. It's not very long. We're almost done. 
There are other strains being placed on crowded spent fuel pools. Systems required to keep pools cool and clean are being overtaxed. As reactor operators generate hotter, more radioactive, and more reactive spent rods. Reactor operators have increased the level of uranium-235, a key fissionable material in nuclear fuel to allow for longer operating periods. This in turn can cause the cladding, the protective envelope around a spent fuel rod, to thin and become brittle. It also builds high, higher pressure from hydrogen and other radioactive gases within the cladding, all of which adds to the risk of failure. The cladding is less than one millimeter thick, thinner than a credit card, and is one of the most important barriers preventing the escape of radioactive materials. This is reminding me of the story of the nuclear chill, the troll that was doing damage control in this thread, I was told, and when they traced and tracked his IP back, whatever, he was in another country, but it went back to a business that did the zirconium cladding for the fuel rods, so he he stood, to, you know, he would lose his job. It's a financial interest. They're protecting their their lucrative salary is what a lot of these people are doing. It's just out of pure greed. A lot of this just continues to go on. Again, the, the ego and the self and the acquisitiveness and the need to acquire more property and effects and everything, It's that it, I think it's crazy myself. I can live quite simply with, you give me guitar and the means to record, I'm pretty happy. I don't need much more than that. The April 26, 1986 nuclear catastrophe at Chernobyl in Ukraine illustrated the damage CCM-137 can wreak. Nearly 200,000 residents from 187 settlements were permanently evacuated because of contamination by cesium-137. Again, 200,000 residents, nearly 200,000, were permanently evacuated. Insurance don't cover against radiation, as we just read about from the uh, physician's uh, Oh, gosh, what the heck are their name again? I need to know these. Physicians for Social Responsibility. God, there's so many acronyms and so many names. Wow. Really begins to boggle my mind here. Okay, nearly 200,000 were evacuated in Chernobyl. The total area of this radiation control zone is huge at more than 6,000 square miles. Okay, what about in Japan? Because this is worse than Chernobyl. We get a 50 square or 50 mile radius evacuation zone. I tell you, all of Japan should be evacuated. It, it's over. It's over. And, and for, furthermore, you want to be very careful about purchasing food or eating sushi or fish or anything from Japan. It could have radioactivity in it. I love Toshiba laptop. It's better than my Dell. It's more my wife's, I should say. I've kind of taken it upon myself to use it as much as I have, but. I like it much better than the Dell, and, and unfortunately, I have to weigh that into account. If I ever get another laptop, maybe I need a Geiger counter, right, so I can test the laptop before I purchase it. This is the realities of nuclear power, absolute realities. There are other strains being placed on crowded spent fuel pools. Systems required to keep pools cool and clean are being overtaxed as reactor operators generate hotter, more radioactive, and more reactive spent rods. Reactor operators have increased the level of uranium-235, a key fissionable material in nuclear fuel, to allow for longer operating periods. This, in turn, can cause the cladding, the protective envelope around a spent fuel rod, to thin and become brittle. It also builds higher pressure from hydrogen and other radioactive gases within the cladding, all of which adds to the risk of failure. The cladding is less than one millimeter thick, thinner than a credit card, and is one of the most important barriers preventing the escape of radioactive materials. The April 26, oh gosh, I've already read that. Um, let's see, 6,000 square miles evacuation equal to about two-thirds the area of the state of New Jersey. Okay, back to the Chernobyl evac zone. It's equal to about two-thirds the area of the state of New Jersey. During the following decade, the population of this area declined by almost half because of migration to areas of lower contamination. I co-authored, and that would be Robert Alvarez, a report in 2003 that explained how a spent fuel pool fire in the United States could render an area uninhabitable that would be as much as 60 times larger than that created by the Chernobyl accident. If this were to happen at one of the Indian Point nuclear reactors located 25 miles from nuclear New York City, <laughs> nuclear city, from New York City, it could result in as many as 5,600 cancer deaths 
and $461 billion in damages. That's probably really conservative, too. And I tell you, these plumes, if you really get into the modeling and begin to understand, they have the potential to travel vast distances and affect land, property, and people very, very far away from where they initiate, the plume is initiated from. The U.S. government should promptly take steps to reduce these risks by placing all spent nuclear fuel older than five years in dry, hardened storage casks, something Germany did 25 years ago. By the way, Germany's out of nuclear power. That's my understanding. And they're doing other technologies, and their economy is blowing up. Their, their, their jobs are being created. Their environment's becoming cleaner and a better, safer place to live. And it's just a win-win situation. But hand-in-hand hand with releasing the suppressed patents and the suppressed technology. I don't deny that. If you're just going to pour $500 million into Solyndra, knowing full well they're limited to 20% efficiency on their solar cells and solar panels, that, that's a... That's, people invest on, the, on a call, it's called a call, and you're saying that the, the stock is going to crash, the business will do poorly. They know it's going to do poorly. Someone made a lot of money off Solyndra, I can tell you that right now. They always do. It would take about 10 years at a cost between 3.5 and $7 billion to accomplish putting all this uh, stuff into dry cask. If the costs were transferred to energy consumers, the expenditure would result in a marginal increase of less than 0.4 cents per kilowatt hour for consumers of nuclear-generated electricity. So it's really not going to take that much to do it. Why aren't they doing it? I mean, this is a matter of national security. How can we have a secure country with all this nuclear waste just laying around? I mean, terrorist attack. My terrorist attack. That's all I need to say. Uh, false flag terrorist attack. Even worse. Even worse, folks. I'm really worried about this stuff. I'm not panicked and I'm not fear-mongering, but the fact is it is it's incredibly serious and it must be and not later, uh, not down the road, but now. I mean, we've two years almost passed since Fukushima. What the heck's going on? Where's the move to shut all these plants down? Where's the move to put all this uh, stuff into storage and to dry cask? I don't see it. We're still vulnerable, very vulnerable right now, very vulnerable. Another payment option is available for securing, well, let me just say this right now, folks, while it's hitting me. Uh, we just got tagged with $9.8 billion on the Bechtel pumps. John Q. Taxpayer paying for that. That's who pays for DOD, right? All the Department of Attack, I mean, I'm sorry, Department of Defense is taxpayer money. That's my understanding. So uh, we can spend $9.8 billion on those pumps when they offered them for free, when they offered them for free, and... Wow, but we can't do it to put stuff in a dry cask. That's blowing my mind. That's blowing my mind. I'm going to record music after this today to get my mind off this. This is nonsense. Really got to call shenanigans on our government right here. Really, and that's a nice way of saying it, being nice today. Mass arrest on an unprecedented scale, right? I didn't have two cups of coffee today before the show, so it's it's unbound, but to some extent it's, it's restrained a little bit. It's restrained a little bit. Still in two hours, I'll give you more than Pete Santilli give you all week or Jones all week. That's a fact. Besides, no disinformation, no gatekeeping. If it's real and serious, and people have been spending, sending me things I haven't had a chance to get to about these gun control and stuff Obama's up up to these days. And I'll try to cover some of that in the near future along with Plumegate. Now let me finish the last bit of this article. So it wouldn't cost much to deal with it. Another payment option is available for securing spent nuclear fuel. Money could be allocated from $18.1 billion in unexpected funds already collected from consumers of nuclear-generated electricity under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to establish a disposal site for high-level radioactive waste. The money's already there. It's in the fund. Wow. <laughs> wow. After more than 50 years, the quest for permanent nuclear waste disposal remains illusory. You got that right. It's all about illusion, though. Uh, Mr. Alvarez, Dr. Alvarez, it's all an illusion. It's all a hoax, isn't it? One thing, however, is clear, whether we like it or not, the largest concentrations of radioactivity on the planet will remain in storage at United States reactor sites for the indefinite future. In protecting America from nuclear catastrophe, safely securing the spent fuel by eliminating highly radioactive crowded pools should be a public safety priority of the highest degree. National security, in my, in my opinion, that is of a national security. It's a gun control, right? Obama's going to run a study with CDC for gun control. Won't do anything for thyroid, for cancer after Fukushima. 
and, and he won't deal with the spent fuel situation. So when Obama tries to force himself a crocodile tear after the Sandy Hook hoax, right? And like I told Obama, what you need to do is dip your finger in a little pepper sauce uh, from your taco, tacorack.com pepper sauce type stuff, and put that in your eye, a little hot pepper in your eye, and then the tears will flow. Then the tears will flow, and then you can say, oh, I'm so broke up about the children in Sandy Hook hoax. Meanwhile, you won't do any kind of cancer study since Fukushima. None that I'm privy to finding out about anyway. Right, and he won't do anything about this nuclear waste situation when the money already exists. Wow, folks, to me that's like criminal negligence at that point. It's so negligent, it's like a mutiny on the bounty top, uh, um, uh, Humphrey Bogart, where he they have to arrest him because he's the captain of the vessel, but he's going crazy and he's going to sink the ship. So we got to put you in iron, sir, because otherwise you lost your mind. You're going to sink the ship. We have no choice. They had to turn around and arrest their superior officer, right? Mass arrest unprecedented scale. Keep thinking about that, folks. we got to envision it first. Envision it before this crime syndicate can be arrested and put in jail and properly charged and sentenced. By the book, by the book. And no violent revolution, none of that, right? All right, look, we've covered this, and, and, and he shows in the end the money is there, the means is there. We only need the will, the political will to do it, and it's simply not happening. Now, uh, 30 minutes left. I don't know if I'll go the whole way. I do want to go back and quickly talk about the revelation I had today as I've been going over these documents for almost a year now. And I had this revelation that as the I progressed and the dates uh, chronologically been extended from the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, up 20, 21, 22, the 23rd of March and the a a incident uh, from the accident, as I've stated earlier, the uh, let's see, how do I phrase this? The overall feel of the conversation in the documents is one from at first people would make mistakes and say things maybe when they shouldn't have, to now it seems like they're very general and vague. There's no specifics. They kind of know what they're talking about, but they avoid mentioning it directly. And so it's less redaction has to happen. I, I do see that. I do see they're consciously see aware of the Freedom of Information Act. They're being recorded later. Some of this may slip out or not get redacted. And I, you know, it's a big thing about it. But, but the revelation I had was simply this. At this point in the documents, what I see is there's an incredible delay. There's a response in their ability to communicate. Indeed, the response itself, the the recovery efforts are hampered by the fact that they are now, they, do, they don't have a line they can communicate freely on. Uh, cover up and everything aside, they can't even talk about other things, the seriousness of it all, because that would indicate that the, the, uh, the seriousness of nuclear power and how dangerous it really is. They don't want that coming out. And so they're watching what they say, and they talk in generalities and they're hinting about the specific things that they can take offline and talk about. They can communicate by some other means and talk about it, but not in this uh, realm, in the situation where they're being recorded for the freedom of information. So my revelation hit me the last couple of days. I'm thinking they're not actually able even to respond to a nuclear accident at peak capacity, at optimal capacity, because the means through which they're communicating with are being recorded. They're uh, consciously aware of this, and they begin to censor themselves. Self-censorship and so I ask you, what are they? How effective is this? I mean, holy crap, Ola! This in and of itself is huge. That that now based solely on the Freedom of Information Act and their prior knowledge that they're being recorded. And as it progresses, they get better and better and, and speak in less specific terms about things. And, and, and although there's still heavy redaction, because at some point they have no choice; they have to mention certain things. But by and large, you begin to see. You say, hey, you know, I don't like the deception. Uh, and I, I hate nuclear power. I'm not a big fan of it. But I do wish in a, an emergency response there's a line of communication. They could just say what they got to say and be done with it. And let's get the rescue efforts in there and try and affect some kind of recovery. But then I see this huge effort to avoid saying things, don't talk about this, don't talk about that, take it offline. The communication lines are hampered. It's a, it is of a detriment now in a big way. And freedom of information we have to have. We have to have it. So we got another problem on our hands here, folks, and that is when there's a meltdown over here, the big one hits over here, not three mile. That was little. They settled for a million point something out of court for a family with a Down syndrome kid. Don't let DOE, Department of Energy, fool you on that one, right? 
when a big one happens over here, we're going to be in a serious situation based solely on the fact they're not going to be able to communicate freely about it, knowing they're being recorded for freedom of information. It's going to hamper the, some of the talk is beneficial about getting pumps in and recovery efforts. What the heck? This, you know what? I can only tell you this. Every facet of this little gem of nuclear power I have found to be flawed. Every facet. And furthermore, you can't polish it out. It's not a stone. You're going to polish it out and bring uh, the luster out of it. Right? It's like a rock on the ground. It's like a dirty rock laying on the ground. It's not a jewel. It's not even a gem. That's what we're looking at right here, folks. They can't even communicate freely because they don't want to slip up and get someone in trouble. They don't want to risk jeopardizing their nice little cash cow in the nuclear power industry. I'm sure they all make great paychecks, right? I get nothing. I'm laboring over the fact that I ever want to accept donations so I can have a freaking Geiger counter, right? So I can do tests on my rainwater here again. I'm disabled. My wife takes care of me. We don't have a lot of money. I'd be lucky to get this GoDaddy website up. I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a website and 22 caliber hitters is going to put it together for me. So I'm I'm very I'm stoked, right? Like the surfers say, I'm pretty stoked about this, man. I'm gonna have my own website away from WordPress, where Stubblebind and these other guys, whoever's doing it, right? Natural News, my articles get paragraphs go missing out of them, and weird things happen. Much more than that, they, certain photographs or screen captures I can't upload to get tagged somehow. It was about the melt through and number four to the Taurus. Pretty damn serious stuff. And that one, that, well, I will say Blog Talk let me upload it, but WordPress, no. Facebook, no. They didn't like it. They blocked that particular screen capture. What's it about? Well, it's about the spent fuel pool number four. It's been drained of water for days, plural days and days and days and days. And, you know, you can spray water on it, but, hey, the, the the top, the roofs of these cave in on them, and the it's hard to get water in on it, right? And so we're talking about it melting and come to these superheated temperatures and literally melting through the floor of the uh, the the uh, spent fuel pool. Now, let's see, I also had a, you know, I guess I closed that. Now, here we go. And this was an analysis um, that I've got the entire file for that... Brookhaven Labs did, and that's a place where my dad actually has worked at before. Brookhaven Labs did a uh, scenario where they ran a meltdown at the Browns Fair Unit. One again, this was a simulation sequence analysis, they call it, and they look in and say that the melted fuel and the spent fuel pool penetrated concrete in under 15 hours. That's in the GE, General Electric Mark One. Again, GE is on the cover up, and so is Bechtel, to be sure, and they own mass media, big heavy interest, and GE does not bring good things to life. Again, corporations decide the government role in, the, in these big nuclear incidents, right? Failed design, but too late. They had already sold them and people had built them, and you can't just recall a nuclear power plant like a car, right? You can make some modifications and try to fix that, but they're all inherently unsafe. And we know when you, when you lose power and you can't circulate the fluid to the spent fuel pool, we're going to begin to have a serious problem. In 15 hours, it can get so hot it melts down through the actual concrete. And here's a little segment from it where it says, at 453.1 minutes, the corium slumps down to vessel bottom. That's the fuel melts. It's like in a slag form, and it melts down to the bottom of the vessel, meaning the spent fuel container. At 454 minutes, debris starts to melt through the bottom head. 542.5 minutes, vessel bottom head fails, resulting in a pressure increase. 542 minutes, debris starts to boil water from containment floor. 542.5 minutes, dry well electric penetration assembly seals have failed as the containment temperature exceeds 240 degrees Celsius, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, and starts to vent through the primary containment at a leak rate of 104 liters, 221 feet cubed per minute. 542.5 minutes, debris starts to melt the concrete floor of the containment building. Temperature of debris is 1766 Celsius, 3,210 degrees Fahrenheit. My 900 Celsius was way off. It gets a lot harder than that, a lot hotter than that. Internal heat generation in metals and oxides are 1.00 times 10 to the power of 7 and 1.83 times 10 to the power of 7 watts, respectively. Again, don't get all 
uh, tweaked out and upset about some of these numbers and these ter terminology. What you need to know is look there at that super heat, 3,210 degrees. You don't get that with solar cell technology. If they re uh, released the restricted patents, you'd have much greater than 20% efficiency, which is why Slender failed, because they're not allowed to be successful. Very simply, they're not allowed to be successful. 596.4 minutes. Containment failed as the containment temperature exceeds 260 degrees Celsius, 500 degrees Fahrenheit, and all electric penetration modules are blown out of the containment. Mass and energy addition rates into the drywall are, and it gives some figures and numbers there, but you get the picture. It doesn't take long for that slag, the corium, to melt through the concrete, and then you're going down into the torsion into the main reactor, and that, that's very problematic. Again, I'm not an expert. I'm a mechanic, an uh, automobile mechanic. Initially, is what I, I trained I went to school for, and then I got into, well, I've had a, a lot of jobs, but I got into uh, automotive salvage, then ended up doing investigative reporting here, and now I'm kind of becoming a little bit more knowledgeable with the nuclear power industry. So while I'm not an expert, I can tell you that it's going to be extremely problematic when that ball of slag melts through into the torus and into all the innards of these nuclear reactors. It's just not a, uh, it's not a good thing. However, a study, we talked about the delayed communication effect because they know they're being recorded, and it's gotten so bad 13, 14 days in that it's a, a, almost a joke to me. When I listen to what they're saying and, and avoid talking in specifics, it's a joke to me. It's an absolute joke. So I, I, I say, hey, what's going to happen over here when something melts down? And they're not able to communicate freely because they know they're being recorded, and it slows down it. It makes it anemic. The response, the communication is anemic communication. They're not allowed to speak freely. And the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, that's not something we ever want to get rid of. Hey, you wouldn't even know what I'm telling you now. Think about how the control, information level of control would be without Freedom of Information Act. Even with a redaction, I can still give you a great idea of the cover-up and who knew kind of what and when. But without that, be at a complete loss, a complete loss. Okay, and it's also Bob Marley's birthday. I wanted to mention that today. I'm a big fan of Bob Marley because I'm about unity, peace, love, friendship, all that kind of stuff. And so I just want to say happy birthday to Bob. I know he's watching down on us down here and saying, man, what a screwed up world. You guys should have smoked some more pot and had less nuclear power, and the planet would be a better place, right? And that's just a fact. That's just, it seems to be a fact, you know? So I'm going to leave it with you guys today, and uh, let's see, what can I give you to give you this jazz song as I get out of here? I'm going to do some recording this afternoon on Confirmed Reptilian. So keep your heads up, keep your spirits up. I have every reason to believe and some discussion among some researchers in the underground. We are causing some of these shills and trolls to, uh, we're putting their feet to the fire and they're having to uh, make moves based on moves we are making by exposing them. So that's nice to know we are having an effect. Information is slowly trickling out. I don't care if it's 10 AF, 10 years after Fukushima, that Plume Gate finally makes it out and hits the mainstream. We're going to keep hammering home on, on this cover-up, on this giant conspiracy, multi-agency. It's huge, and it revealed to me and many others the fact that alternative media was completely co-opted and owned. The fact that months and months and months and months went by with great screen captures, great information, the FOIA, totally ignored, totally ignored by them, even though researchers, and not just myself, were sending them all the information, gift wrapping it, sending it to them on a platter, uh, putting it on their table right in front of them, writing the article saying, even use this article, put your name on it. We don't care. we got to get this information out. And it didn't. So Plumgate revealed also this giant cover-up within the, the media, the alternative media, and then there's a cover-up of that cover-up. So it gets really deep. And it's kind of mind-boggling at times, some of these abstract things. you got to kind of play this a giant chess game. A third dimensional, three dimensional chess game. You have to play. You have to think ahead, and you got to think behind, and everywhere in between. It's very difficult, but it revealed all that and a lot more. So that's what's the importance of Plume Gate. However long it takes to get the information out, that's what we're going to do. And I'll try to cover other relevant issues as well. I'm going to go back and and talk some more about some gun control and what have you, because I do realize that you know for many years I I never I didn't have a gun. I wasn't big on guns. I shot them as a kid. My brother was into guns a lot. 
I never was. And, and I got to the point where I began to wonder, why, why do we even need guns? You know, why do so many of these crazy people have guns? We don't need them. Well, when I began to study politics, political science, global trends, you know, that kind of his, history, historically speaking, uh, I began to run into the bleeding obvious, and that is the only the last line of defense between you and a tyrannical government is your sad little semi-automatic AR-15. It's not much. 30 rounds in a clip ain't much when someone could theoretically be using a much more fantastically lethal uh, device with a killing capacity they measure in megadeths, you know, aerosol sprays to knock you out. It's incredible when you study the technology in the killing area of killing, right? It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. They got all that. So the last little tiny thing you got is that sad single shot. I know it's semi-automatic, but it's not a burst round of a 50 caliber machine gun or the XM8 or any of these things. And that's all we got. That is all we got. And I'm a pacifist and I wage peace. But again, like I say, I made an about face change in my stance. I said, yep, it's not for duck hunting. That's what they that's what they want you to talk about. Duck hunting? No, of course you don't need a 30 round clip to duck hunt. We ain't talking about duck hunting here. We're talking about like if Hitler was going to take over and send us to the gas chambers. We'd be very happy and pleased to have a weapon with even semi-automatic capabilities to at least say, hey, you may try to come get me, but I'm going to take a couple of you with me. Right? And that's your right. That is absolutely your right. Again, I'm very clear, though. I wage peace and education and enlightenment above all. And then I do understand that the reason there's a Second, second Amendment is when all else fails. When all else fails. In the original... Patrick Henry, that's what he was about. In his famous speech, that they later, the people that listened to it, after his speech, they got together and said, write down as best we can remember what this guy just said, because he just blew our mind. But in that speech, he basically said, I know not about you, but for me, give me liberty or give me death. And he, he, he said, essentially, we've tried every avenue with the British crown, everything, time and time and time again. He, and he said, look at this point, the time for negotiations have you know, come to an end. There's there there's no outlook. There's no advance. Nothing's changing. We're not getting anywhere. The oppression is too much. We've suffered too long. They want us to keep dragging it out. They want us to keep trying to work it out. And at some point, I do recognize that you you know you may reach that point. We're not there yet. So I will continue to talk about a gun control and why we need a Second Amendment and why it applies not to duck hunting but to having an AR-15, which in my opinion we need need to have the capability. Your average uh, a citizen, just like in Switzerland, I think, where it's at, where they are issued an AR-15, which is, or M-16, which is exactly like the ones that the U.S. Army uses, the select fire single burst round fully automatic, and that's what we need. I think we need to scale down less on the big sense in military terms and say, why don't we just arm our citizens, educate them, enlighten them, give them great mental health care, right? We want that for everybody in this country, man. There's no sense... Uh, being uh, uh, greedy with the health care. Let's get everyone physically healthy, mentally healthy, educated, teach them a value for life, and then you issue them an M16. And, and, you know, we already know Japan would never have invaded this country back in World War II, not based on just civilian weapon population alone. So unless you're conducting some kind of colonialism or hegemony or trying to take over the world, now, we don't really need this kind of money to be uh, funneled into this type of military advancement. Really don't. DARPA, what are they doing for us? At some point, they're going to become, if they're not already, uh, a liability and, in fact, a danger and a national security threat, if you think about it, because uh, uh, power concentrated in the hands of the few, it always corrupts, always corrupts. In fact, like Heinlein said, it's not that it even corrupts. It attracts that kind of person right from the get-go. The people, the kind of people that want power are those kind of people. The rest of us, like myself, I don't want power. I don't want recognition. I don't want to be famous. I want the world to change. And if I could just disappear back into the Turtle Shell Studios and recording music, that's what I would be doing. I don't even want rec It doesn't matter getting an award. I don't care about some recognition or whatever. And it's probably not going to happen anyway for those of us who are in this area of trying to expose the hardcore truths. Don't plan on it coming because whistleblowers are not held high in this country. In fact, they're kind of looked down. They're frowned upon. They're frowned upon, right? Okay, so that's going to cover it for today. This is Hattrick Penry, and you've been listening to Hattrick Penry Unbound on Blog Talk Radio. And here's a little bit of Dave Brubeck to send you off. I should have loaded up some Bob Marley, but y'all think of Bob Marley today. And think about unity and peace and the message that Bob Marley was spreading, all right? Hattrick Penry, over and out. The U.S. Scientific Magazine making the gloomy.
The doomsday clock has ticked one minute closer to global catastrophe. It now stands at five minutes to midnight. The U.S. scientific magazine making the gloomy forecast says world leaders are not doing enough to promote nuclear disarmament. The clock is a symbolic barometer showing how close mankind is to self-annihilation. The magazine Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists announced its decision on Tuesday. It said the roadmap to a nuclear-free world remains unclear because leaders of the U.S., China, North Korea, and others have failed to achieve significant progress. The magazine also referred to the disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in Japan. It says the accident shows that even peaceful use of nuclear power can become a threat to humans and raises safety questions about complex technology.